This is Invest Talk. Independent thinking, shared success. Justin Klein and Steve Peasley stand ready to take your finance and investment questions and share their unbiased answers. Invest Talk is made possible by KPP Financial, a registered investment advisor firm serving clients throughout the United States. The clarity for your path forward starts now. Here is KPP Chief Executive Officer, Financial Advisor, Justin Klein. Good afternoon, fellow investors, and welcome back to Invest Talk. This is our Thursday, September 21st, 2023 edition. I'm Justin Klein, and since it is Thursday, we do have Luke Guerrero back with us. Thanks for being here, Luke. Thank you for having me. And our goal each and every weekday, and especially on Thursdays, when Luke is here, is to give you some actionable advice, some some data that can help you take that next step. It's a journey for all of us. Some have been doing it longer than others. I've been doing this for over 20 years. So clearly, I've seen different cycles, the way especially the average investor reacts. I, I, get a, I glean a lot from the calls that we get, what people are thinking about, what's top of mind. And so there's a lot of lessons there that we're, we – we touch on uh, each and every weekday, and that is our goal, is to give you the knowledge and the framework to consistently make good decisions. It's not about that next stock that you might buy or next opportunity. It's about having the toolkit to identify opportunities and risks in the market. So we're going to talk about the market performance today, also run down some show topics, but we're First, going to touch on our first caller question at 888 chart Hi, Steve and Justin. I'm interested in buying Cummings, uh, ticker symbol CMI, as a long-term hold. And I'm just wondering what you guys think a good entry price would be. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. All right. This is Cummings Engines. And this is one of the top manufacturers of diesel engines, mainly used in commercial trucks, off-highway equipment, railroad locomotives, even power generation. So, you know, we don't use a lot of diesel anymore for power generation, but when we do, Cummins engines, they're, they're the cream of the crop. And they've historically had very good profitability. If you look at their return on equity, for example, over the last, really the life of their business, it's hung around the, the mid 20% range, which is very, very healthy. Obviously, during recessions and uh, in times of economic decline, it, it will dip down. However, it is a very profitable, consistently profitable business. Now, the, the first question you have to ask is, how exposed is it to a slowing economy? Now, what I will say is, there's been a lot of backup, backup in demand uh, for, or pent up demand, excuse me, pent up demand during the pandemic when not enough trucks were being built, and so Cummins struggled during that time. But obviously, recently their their business has uh, reaccelerated. So, Luke, is this a name that will be dragged down further? It's been it's pulled back a little bit already. Uh, from an economic downturn, or do you think a dip is something that would be an opportunity? I think a dip is something that would be an opportunity. I think that this, for to me, after looking at it fundamentally, I mean, its 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 relative valuation has been pretty stable actually over the mm -hmm. past three years. Fundamentally, it's a good company, as you mentioned. Its cash flow looks good. For me, this is less of a micro or technical question, but more a macro question. What do you think is going to be the short, medium term outlook of the types of clients that this company is servicing? It may struggle in the near term, but I think that looking towards a longer term hold, which is mm -hmm. what she's talking about, this yeah. is certainly a good good business. Yeah, and I like the fact that their balance sheet is pretty strong. Minimal debt, about seven billion dollars in net debt on a thirty-two billion dollar market cap, and uh, about a billion dollars a year in free cash flow. Uh, strong balance sheet there. Uh, now, once again, it is cyclical to a degree, but overall, if you have a, a reshoring of manufacturing, building of uh, the manufacturing facilities, that's going to take a lot of trucks and, and moving of, of uh, large quantities of, of energy and raw materials, etc. And 
you know, they're just going to be in demand. So I, I, we like this business, you know, technically near term, it does look a bit bearish short term, but uh, a buy in the right around the maybe the 210 level, that would be a great area to pick it up right now. It's at 228. So that's Cummins Engine, a great company to have on anyone's watch list. All right, let's go to Chris in Florida. Let's we'll talk about ZBRA. Hey, Justin. Um, yeah, I picked some of this up um, back at earnings when it dropped down to like 243-ish. Um, and I was just wondering what you think about the company and the business. I think I remember a while back you had mentioned that it was on the watch list and you thought it was good around 250. Um, I saw that Morgan Stanley downgraded um, price target down to like 220. Just wondering what you guys think about it now. Yeah, I remember talking about this and this was coming off of its high and there was major support uh, around the 250 level. And what you can see is it bounced around there for a while. Uh, but the issue with that is that when you have a support level and it hangs around that support level for long enough, it no longer becomes support. A, the, the power is that it will break through that to the downside. And you're starting to see that now down to 228, the lowest level. Let me go back. To break those lows, it's almost breaking the lows from last uh, last year. Now, we'll make it a little bottom. We shall see. But Zebra is a good business. For everyone out there, this is Zebra Technologies. And they, they make basically RFID tags, encoders, printers, etc. And there are certain applications where that is very, very uh, useful. I remember 20 years ago, this was kind of a new technology. And it was going to be the standard but it hasn't quite been the standard, but uh, Zebra is kind of the leader within this particular uh, space. So the, the issue here, though, is that earnings are $17.47 last year. So it's going to make only $9.77 this year. That's why you're seeing that retrench. But go back up to nearly $12 per share earnings next year. Uh, technically, you know, I think you, I might take a shot at it here because of the history of the strong business and the fact that you know, you could have an easy out if it breaks, you know, below say 220, then you have a small loss. And I think there's a lot of potential upside. I really like this business, Luke. Do you think it's worth taking a shot here, even if the earnings picture has declined recently? Yeah, I think the earnings picture is is less than ideal. Its free cash flow has slipped over the past couple of years as well, but it does have a lot of room to run in that it doesn't have to. It doesn't have a high cost of servicing its debt, right? Mm -hmm. it's, its EBIT to interest coverage ratio is is eight times. That's good. It's got some wiggle room. Two twenty eight where it is right now. It looks like it's kind of slipping below some of those support levels. So there mm -hmm. might be some price discovery down there. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't buy it today, but it might be when it settles and kind of finds where it wants to settle. A good a good investment. Yeah, yeah. I think that's. That's the big question: Is do you want to uh, do you want to bet that it will hold this support level in the two twenty five area, or do you want to wait for some sort of confirmation, like a, a reversal or something like that? That's the, that's the question. Uh, once again, there if you just have an out around two twenty, there's minimal risk here, uh, and that might be the trade to go with. All right, thanks for the call, Chris. A couple of good companies to start it off. I love that. Now, we have a lot of ground to cover in the next 45 minutes, and time permitting, we're going to touch on our main focus point, which is more proof that crypto fraud is possible even when you're dealing with somebody who works for a major bank. So we're going to look at a recent digital fraud case coming out of an investment banker out of a, a very large company. So we're going to look at that. Also, we're going to touch on treasury yields climbing to a 16-year high and what kind of impact that will have. And does that mean we're in for sustained rates up at these levels? We'll talk about that. Also, renewable energy. We know that governments around the world are pushing for the development of renewable energy. And we're going to look at the cost of that and how much that's come down and whether or not that's probably sustainable, right? The, the, the decline in costs. And then lastly, ARM and Instacart are, have come, have, have, are now public or is, is Instacart public yet? I know, I know ARM was a couple of days ago. It is. Ar okay. It is. Yeah. Instacart, they're both public. Ticker symbol cart. There we go. Makes sense. <laughs> and there's that, that means that the IPO market is opening back up after, Kind of a full year plus of hiatus where not many companies felt it was a good time to go public. But what do these particular 
ones that hit the market tell us about the IPO market going forward. So that's what's on the docket for us today. We're going to touch on some voice bank questions. One is in regards to QUID, the PIMCO Sterling Short Maturity ETF. And now let's get to the market today. We had the Fed day yesterday and the reaction was negative and there was a follow through day today certainly on the growth side of the market palantir down five percent tesla down four two and a half percent amazon down four point four percent amd down four point two uh let's see what else nvidia down two point nine percent on news that for the third month in a row traffic in chat gpt was down which Probably shouldn't be a shock to most people, uh, but definitely some big movers to the downside on that kind of breakout in yields. Luke, what did you see in the market? Yeah, well, I think for some time, people have been operating under the assumption that the Fed was going to continue to pause. And as you see in the Fed futures market, there's the potential for another 25 basis point hike at some point this year. So really, the eyes weren't on the immediate Fed decision, but rather the summary of economic projections. And what the market was doing today was repricing a Fed that was maybe slightly more hawkish than they anticipated uh, even a week ago. And that is that if you look at the, the SEP report that they released, you'll see that through 2024, the median projection is that the target rate is going to be at 5.1%. So what that tells you is a lot of those cuts that people had been pricing in towards the end of last year – Next may year. potentially sorry the end of next year rather yeah. may potentially be pushed out to 2025. So what is that going to do for corporate earnings? What's that going to do for the ability of companies to invest in positive NPV projects? The market is digesting a lot of this and repricing a lot of securities because of it. Now what's interesting about the odds is that the odds of a, of at least one more rate hike this year is still on is still less than 50%. The odds of November is 73% of a pause, 26% of an increase. The odds in December are 55% that it'll stay where it's at today. So a 55% chance that it will be the same Fed funds rate at the end of the year as it is right now. So the market's kind of ignoring that median dot plot like you, you, you told, you, you talked, we talked about yesterday that there's going to be a 25 basis point rate hike. Well, I think that it's less – focused on the 25 basis point potential rate hike this year and more focused on the higher for longer mm -hmm. portion of what that report is saying, yeah. which is if you expect mid next year to see some cuts, maybe you'll see 25 basis points, but we are serious about keeping rates higher for longer and we are serious about not letting inflation creep back up. Yeah. And I know I watched the, the conference yesterday and I felt Powell was a bit wishy-washy and he talked about being careful. He mentioned careful many times, which is like, okay, if you are that hard and fast and stopping inflation, are you really being that careful? Right. So it, to me, it was it was a little bit of a change in rhetoric, and it's always iterative. You know, when they go from being hawkish on inflation to maybe a bit more dovish. So. It'll be very interesting to see how uh, this evolves and this breakout in rates if that kind of changes their mind. But obviously, we still have six weeks to go before the next Fed meeting. All right. Now, as we go to a break, let me remind you to check out our new Invest Talk Classroom series. And it jives well with today's main focus point, And that is in regards to our cryptocurrency deep dive. Luke and I get into it. It's a complex subject. And in today's environment, the crypto scene, in a lot of cases, have been hijacked by a lot of bad actors. So we dig into the casino that the crypto world has become and talk about the risks involved. And you can find out more about that video on YouTube and just search the Invest Talk Classroom. All right, now, my phone lines are open, waiting for your questions at 888 chart A quick reminder, if there's a term that you hear mentioned on the program, but you're unclear about what it means or you have a question about it, we want you to ask. It's very likely that you're not the only one with that same question. 888-99-CHART. Everybody wants a secure financial future, but getting there take strategy, discipline, and the right information. Justin Klein is ready to provide his unbiased answers. So don't forget to call 
Invest Talk. 888-99-CHART. Hi, Stephen Justin. This is Mike from Tracy. How do you guys determine a value stock? And does the value stock change in different economic conditions? Great show, avid listener, and I greatly appreciate you guys. Have a great day and look forward to hearing your answer. Bye. That is a great question. So the question is, how do you determine what is a value stock? Well, traditionally, when you think about value versus growth, what that means is the relative value of a company. So what does it look like in terms of its price relative to its book value or price relative to its cash flows? And how does that compare to other countries in the universe? Value companies stocks, in sorry, other co- companies <laughs> yes. in the universe. Value right. stocks are going to have lower relative prices. Growth stocks, higher relative prices. All right, we're taking a quick break, and we'll pick this up on the other end. Give us a call at 888-99-CHART. Justin Klein and Steve Peasley are ready to take on your finance and investment questions. So don't forget to call InvestTalk, 888-99-CHART. Now, before the break, we had a call about value investing and whether that changes based on the economic environment. And as Luke correctly stated, is it, value is always relative, what the current price is relative to some sort of metric, whether that's book value, cash flow, et cetera. And what I would say is that it changes based more on the multiples that companies are trading at in the market in general. So back in late 70s, early 80s, equities in general were drastically undervalued and almost across the board. And you were, back then you were finding names that were trading well below book value. In today's environment, it's very hard to find a company that's trading below book value. And so what might look pretty cheap today might have been expensive back in the early 80s, for example. So it's not about the economic environment, but more about the market environment and what multiples are more broadly. So when you're looking at price to cash flow, price to earnings, price to book value, et cetera, the, those multiples that you're looking at uh, are in relation to the median you're going to find in the market and whether that's below the median or above the median is the way I would look at it. Anything to add, Luke? It's all relative. It's all relative, yeah. Everything is relative. Life is relative. All right. Now, my, our focus point today looks in the story behind this headline. More proof that cryptocurrency fraud is abound. And this is- If you is, needed any more proof. If you needed any more proof, right? Yeah, so Rashawn Russell, he is a former Deutsche Bank investment banker, is facing up to 30 years in prison. And- Ordering ordered to pay restitution of more than one point five million dollars that he stole from investors who he promised huge returns from crypto trading. What else? We know the the age old act of uh, crypto trading just taking people from rags to riches. The lesson here is similar to the lesson of any snake oil salesman, if you will, which is if somebody comes to you and tells you that if they you give them money. They will guarantee a gigantic return. They guarantee it no matter what. Run and hide. And I think most people can grasp that. To me, the bigger lesson here is even if they are working for a reputable institution like Deutsche Bank, I guess you can, if you want to call it Deutsche Bank <laughs> a reputable institution, even if they are a licensed broker, which in his – it's what he said to prospective – investors was that he was a licensed broker and that was true but he wasn't acting as a broker he was acting what would you call it as a rogue individual really right with no oversight there's no oversight in crypto and what he did is he said he would earn large sums of money sometimes guaranteed returns from what is called r3 a cryptocurrency fund he claimed to run himself and instead of running cryptocurrency fund, what did he do? He siphoned the money into his own accounts and used the funds for what else? Gambling, which 
I guess you could say, you know, is that far off from crypto trading? In a way, what he really did was give his quote unquote investors the crypto experience and skipped the middle step. There you go. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, but he also sprinkled in some personal expenses as well. You have to. Yeah, you have to, you know, you gotta, if you want to you spend money to make money, right? Apparently he spent a lot of money. Well, uh, and so uh, that's really the lesson in, in my mind. It's just, we all know it's too good to be true probably is and don't just this this happens in a, i call it affinity scams i think that's the mm-hmm. most dangerous one it, and this happens a lot in the church for example where oh it's some it's somebody in the church i met them in the church they're good people they're not going to defraud me almost the most most of the frauds that are out yeah. there are uh, are affinity scams in some sense and it may not be church it may be your local racquetball club or your 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 local activity club that you meet somebody in and you think oh they are like me because they like x y and z and therefore they're trustworthy that doesn't matter you need to throw all that out the window and always focus on the reality of the situation do your due diligence and make sure that whoever it is no matter what they're saying whoever they work for or whatever things they like that you might like or the people that they know that you know it's irrelevant it's all about the assets that they're investing in, what makes sense, and what is the risk versus reward? Because there's always risk when you're taking some, there's always risk when you're trying to get some level of reward. If you want risk free, hey, go earn five and a half percent now in a treasury. Another lesson I think that you can garner from this is to not invest in things that you yourself don't understand. Yeah. If and very some, few people understand, and very people understand, alt, few people alt crypto. understand crypto. Alt, alt crypto, yeah. the off exchange stuff, the, the decentralized finance. Exactly. I think a lot of people within this industry, within the financial industry, try and make things overly complicated so investors don't understand what's going on, mm-hmm. which is why I specifically love coming here on Thursday to help our listeners understand and, and pare back the curtain a little bit. So it's important when people try and try and come at you with these types of investments that you you, you take a step back and you start to think. And educate yourself. And if you don't know... Go and find somebody that does, that isn't that person. And in today's world, there's there's a lot of information out there. So it's easy to get yourself educated. And that's why we do those Invest Talk Classroom series. All right. Now, in the next Invest Talk, we look at the story behind this question. Can emerging technology make EV ownership practical? Many more EVs are on the way, but the charging infrastructure build out is still in its early stages. And the needed battery breakthrough has not materialized. That story tomorrow. But for now, I'm Justin Klein with Luke Guerrero, and we are ready to take your calls at 888-99-CHART. One of the most rewarding things I do each weekday is host the Invest Talk podcast. I truly enjoy helping investors, and I know that every question counts and every answer I provide will be unbiased. You, the caller, get to chart the course for each Invest Talk podcast. Call with your questions anytime, day or night, 888 99Chart. Hi, Steve, Justin, and Luke. It's Alex here from the UK. I wanted to ask a question on a couple of ETFs that were raised to me from my trading platform as a good place to park any cash that's not invested. And I just wanted to get your ideas and make sure that I have a full understanding before I put my money there. The two funds are Quid and Mint. Um, Both are PIMCO. Um, Quid is a sterling short maturity ETF. Uh, QUID and the other one is PIMCO as well and that is a enhanced short maturity active exchange traded fund MINT. Um, both have good dividend um, yields and um, or yields and I just wanted to know if you would be able to give some more information on these and what the risks are um, whether there's a significant risk to the capital or um, if these, as I suspect, are fairly um, non-volatile. Um, any information is really appreciated. And if you have time, any sectors that you are particularly bullish on um, for the next couple of years, just so I can uh, align my portfolio. Thanks a lot. And uh, I look forward to hearing the answer on uh, on the show. All right. Well, Luke, why don't you touch on QUID and I'll talk about Mint. 
Of course. So QUID is a USIT, which just means that it is an ETF launched under the regulatory body of what goes on in the UK. It's a different, mm-hmm. different which collective. Which makes sense. He's from England. Indeed. Different collective investment uh, guidelines there. And it is primarily invested in short-term bonds of not just the United Kingdom, but also the United States, Japan, and Canada that round out four of the top five. So generally speaking, what they're going to do is invest in UK sterling-denominated bonds, but also bonds denominated in other currencies, and then hedge that back to pound sterling. Makes sense. So... Typically, these are low volatility, good places to park money. PIMCO is obviously one of the most famous of fixed income managers. I don't see any problems with this fund, and I imagine that it's going to be a similar place to hold money as Mint. Now, what is the uh, duration on QUID as well as the, uh, the fee? The fee is 35 basis points. Okay. That is the net expense ratio. And it looks like... Thirty percent is held in medium term notes, and then another twenty percent held in mortgage backed securities. So, short to medium duration okay. securities. And what about the yields? Current yield? Uh, the current yield is blank on what I'm seeing, which oh. is not true. <laughs> Obviously, yeah. So it doesn't look like we have the data. It's always hard to get those overseas ones. Now, Mint is easier. This is on the U.S. exchanges, and it's Pimco Enhanced Short Maturity Active ETF. And this is a very short duration, only. 0.1 years. So you're talking about a little over a month. The average credit quality is A+. plus. They do dip into the corporates, securitize, such as uh, Fannie and Freddie, uh, government, which would be treasuries. And the issue here, though, is that the, the fee is similar, about 35 basis points. And then you have a yield right around 5.5%. So still very low risk. Is it Better than just buying an ultra short term treasury ETF at this point. I don't see there's not much difference in yield here, and you're probably going to get a lot lower fee from something like that. So I think these are fine. I don't have any issues with them, but you're not really catching or picking up more yield, much more yield than you are from just buying treasuries. I will say, given that the caller is from the United Kingdom, one thing that may change your opinion on what to invest in is how it's treated from a tax perspective. Yeah. So if you're in a sterling denominated USIT, you may have beneficial tax mm-hmm. considerations mm-hmm. relative to investing in a treasury fund. So there are some other things that do go into whether or not you would want to hold quid or mint or just a treasury fund, yeah. uh, especially for somebody outside the US. Yeah, but I think both of these are fine. I have no problem with owning either of them. All right, let's go to Dan in Walnut Creek. Wants to talk about Devon Energy. Hi there, uh, Justin, and thanks for taking my call. Um, sure. Yeah, um, Devin Ener- Energy, um, I'm down about 12%. It seems to be not doing a whole lot. Um, the the numbers look pretty good as far as I can tell. Um, and I was wondering what you guys thought of it. All right, Devon Energy is on a in a downtrend below all the major moving averages. The 200-day moving average is pointed down as well as the 100-day moving average, and those are clear indications that you're in a pretty strong downtrend. And that's pretty curious considering if you look at the XLE, that is in a strong uptrend. Now, it has pulled back over the past week, but all the major moving averages are pointed upwards, and it's above 50, the 200, and the 100-day moving average. So what's the problem here is, is really the question. Why is this underperforming the, the the broad index? And I don't have a clear answer for you, but I think it's clear you much rather own many other names within this space. Now, Devon Energy, it's a large integrated EMP company uh, here in the United States and Canada, $30 billion market cap. But earnings are expected to decline 33% this year. Last quarter, earnings are down 54%. Revenue is down 39%. And they do have a little bit of debt on their balance sheet. But but whereas if you look at most of the other large EMPs, they pay down almost all of their debt and are are fairly debt-free. And so you're trading at about four times enterprise value to EBITDA. A lot of the other ones are trading more like three times. And... I just don't love the trend here. I think there's much better opportunities. And a good example of when you chase that 7.4% yield, you're ignoring 
the business. You're focusing too much on the dividend and not on the underlying business. And clearly it's not performing nearly as well as its competitors. Anything to add, Luke? Yeah, nothing really to add. Uh, Just as as you said, I was trying to find some specific reasons why this company might be underperforming. I didn't find them, but I do think, like you mentioned, it's a valuable lesson in in understanding that uh, dividends should not be the the be-all, end-all of investing. Because certainly in this environment, you would expect companies such as Devon Energy to do well. So maybe it's time to, to move on to a different one. Yeah, I mean, the relative strength on XLE is 84. On Devon Energy, it's 25. Yeah. <laughs> so it's drastically underperforming. I'd move on. You're in the right space. You're just in the wrong name. Okay. Thanks for the call. All right, let's touch a bit on treasury yields. Treasury yields hit a 16-year high today. And the 10 years up 13 basis points. We closed. Let's see. What did we close at? Let's go to TNX. We closed at 4.48%. Let's call it for rounding purposes, 4.5%. The 30-year, that was up 15 basis points, up to 4.55%. And this is all because, obviously, the Fed uh, the Fed reaction uh, yesterday, or Fed announcement yesterday, but also unemployment claims fell to the lowest level since January. So just more economic data that shows, hey, yes, the economy is slowing, but not really that much. And the jobs market's not weakening to a point where, hey, they, they should be cutting rates. And I think the big question is, what is the knock-on effect here? And is this a sign that rates are breaking out? Or is it more of a sign that maybe we're getting in a sh- uh, we're, we're hedge funds, investors are getting too strongly positioned in one way? Could be. I think the most interesting thing that I've seen related to rates actually after the release of the summary of economic projections is that the market right now is pricing in that in the long term, the U.S. economy can handle a 3.5% target rate, whereas the Fed is only saying 2.5%. So is this just a caveat of that or rather a carve out of that saying that, yes, we think we can be higher for longer, but we think we can be a lot higher for longer? Is this the market doing that? I don't know. It's certainly an interesting time and in that we're seeing we're seeing yields rise to a level that we haven't seen in over a decade. What's most interesting to me is that the move index, which is kind of the volatility index of the treasury market, which blew out in March during the banking crisis, well above the, the 150 level where things become a problem. This happened. It was above 150 in the fall as well when you had the guilt issue. You had the uh, JGP, J- JGB uh, problem over in Japan. And liquidity started to get better, really, uh, starting last fall. But this isn't reasserting itself to the upside. It's still below the 110 level or at 106 right now. Mm-hmm. So it's not showing us that there's a lot of stress in the treasury market despite the broader sell-off. Now, the big question is, maybe that's the was the BTFD or I, f- I forgot the acronym, but basically allowing banks to offload any losses on longer term treasuries. And it means there's not a lot of forced sellers. Yeah. Because instead of selling and having to, you know, shore up your balance sheet, all you have to do is did I say sure? Shore up your balance sheet. Uh, all you have to do is take those securities, give them to the Fed. Maybe you have to pay a punitive rate to do that, but you're not forced to sell them. And I think that's even more interesting is that rates are up without a lot of forced sellers. But I know hedge funds are near record short. So in, in my mind, I think we're actually closer to the peak in rates as opposed to some major breakout. Now, is there is this a sign that we're in a longer term trajectory of interest rates higher? I do. Because technically, when you get series of higher highs and higher lows, you're in an uptrend. And we continue to see that even with this pullback in the 10 year from last fall, it made a clear higher low and didn't stay down for very long. And now we've hit now two consecutive, uh, you know, we had a, a higher high in August, now we're another higher high here in September. And so it, it to me, it's it's just reasserting that idea that, hey, we're in an inflationary environment. Rates are headed higher. We're not going back to 3% mortgages. We're not unlikely to see that over in the next probably decade or two, or maybe even three. Um, but, and you have to get used to that. And the market 
I think needs to adjust to that. And what's interesting to me is that they're getting this rollover in the growth side of the market, which typically is most uh, impacted by that those higher rates. And are you getting this happened in 2000 when you had the initial bust in from the spring of 2000 into the end of the year? We had a counter trend rally in 2001, and it rolled over again and really ground the the, the Nasdaq grinded lower through. 2003, I think it was late 2003 is when they made the fi- the final bottom. Are we going to go through that same pattern now? And is this a spark of that? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, we we're talking about the growth rollover. I think one problem that people have in seeing what's going on is that so much of growth's performance is wrapped up in a few names that actually have been doing pretty well, even in the high interest rate environment names like we have mentioned before apple google names that have a lot of cash on their balance sheets Mm -hmm. and aren't as affected Mm -hmm. by raising rates because they can grab the yield that's now available to everybody so i think that probably as we move forward what we're going to see is this continued rollover of growth names uh there's certainly a potential economic slowdown on the horizon as the saudis seem bent on throwing the price of oil up as high as possible there's a lot of headwinds on the horizon that may not allow us to keep rates higher for longer. Well, it's a question if they focus on the core rate or the headline rate. True. Because if energy prices continue to go up, that's going to crowd out spending elsewhere Mm -hmm. and create deflation in the rest of the environment Mm -hmm. and in the rest of the economy. And so I think it's, it'll be interesting to see what they pay attention to. Now, going back to what you said of these large companies that they have cash in their balance sheet, higher Treasury rates actually helps them because they can invest that and earn a nice yield. And I just look at the ratio of like ARC to the Qs, which we know ARC, most of the names in there are not those cash rich companies. Many of them are losing money. They're uh, serial serial issuers of shares. Uh, And that ratio of ARC to the Qs is testing the the lows of the year. Mm -hmm. And so I think uh, that's your tell that this is more about those, uh, those, I want to say non-quality names really taking on the chin due to higher rates. All right, let's go and keep things moving and pivot to our next call at 888-99 chart. Hey, Dan from New York. Just a quick question. Long time listener. Congrats on all the success, but uh, just wondering what your thoughts are on gold right now. GDX, GDXJ, maybe SLV too. Just wondering if uh, it's a good time for metals given increased inflation, printing of money and uh, yeah, just fiat debasement. Thanks. Yeah, today was a very interesting day because silver was actually up on the day with a major sell-off. And we know when silver outperforms gold, that means you typically are in a bull market for precious metals. And we've been in kind of a consolidation period for the better part of a year. That ratio has pretty much gone sideways for, yeah, basically a year. And But it looks like it's trying to break out to the upside now. And that's one tell that we're in a, in, in a bull market. Now, obviously, it depends on the type of risk you want to take. If you want to... The, the, the safest way to play precious metals is just owning gold, right? GLD. If you want to take one risk higher, that would be silver. And then another, probably a couple steps higher, would buy the miners because they're going to be much more volatile. They, the... the the cost to pull things out of the ground, pull these minerals out of the ground uh, can be variable. A lot of that has to do with energy prices. If energy prices go up, it, it's it's harder and, and costs more to, to uh, run the machinery to uh, to mine these things. So uh, I think what's impressive, though, is the fact that yields are breaking out, but gold's not really breaking down. You know, the dollar is strong, but gold's not really breaking down. It's pulled back since May, but it still has a upward, upward sloping 200-day moving average, and it's Clearly in an uptrend, but uh, you know, and at major support. So I think this is a good time to, to buy it on this pullback and due to the relative strength. All right. Now let's pivot over to actually, we're going to head to a break. I'm Justin Klein with Luke Guerrero, and we have one goal here each and every weekday, and that's to help you achieve your own version of financial freedom. And our work continues after this final break. So get your questions in now at 888 99 chart. The stock market is volatile. It's constantly changing. So how are you positioned? Is your portfolio properly balanced or are you taking unnecessary risks? 
You can get guidance anytime for free if you go to investtalk.com and take the brief risk alize quiz. Hey, Steve or Justin, Chris from Florida here. Just had a question about Azenta Inc. A Z T A. I was looking for some exposure into like healthcare and stuff, but this is also seems like it's kind of an IT small cap kind of growth. Just wondering what you thought about it. Thanks for your help and you have a great day. Azenta. Okay, this is a small cap name, about three billion dollar market cap. Well down from its high just a couple of years ago, around $125 per share. Now we're hanging around $48 per share. Did have a, I would imagine it was earnings in early August when it popped up from 47 all the way to a high of around 60. Now we're back, like I said, around $48 per share. They provide life science solutions worldwide, impact, enabling impactful breakthroughs and therapies to make to, to market faster. Now, here is my issue with the biotech space in general and adjacent companies, companies that benefit from the biotech space like Azenta. It's that, you know, biotechs are the original Ponzi stocks, original Ponzi names. It was selling the dream, selling the dream that they're going to cure whatever disease they were searching to cure for. And they would do that by just issuing stock. They would finance it by issuing stock. And a lot of tech companies have recently uh, followed that same mantra. But the, the history of biotech says when the cost of capital goes up, the ability to finance the research and development goes down. And the adjacent businesses go down as well. So you look at like Thermo Fisher is a, a perfect uh, example. Very large cap name. Uh, but that has peaked out around six eighty now around uh, five hundred dollars per share. But Azenta is along the same vein. Luke, what does the earnings trajectory look like? They don't make money. Okay. And so well, it says they make money, but are they really profitable? Their even margins negative thirteen percent. Okay. Um, it looks like over the past two years, their profitability has been slipping into the red. Mm -hmm. Their next quarter, they are projected to be positive, but mm -hmm. the previous three quarters, looks like they were near zero in earnings per share in June. Previous three quarters, four quarters were negative. Now, in my opinion, is, is not the time to invest in these type of companies that can't consistently fund and sustain themselves. And if you look at the shares outstanding, they have bought back shares. I will say that. That's interesting. Gone from 75 million shares outstanding at the fall of last year to 59 million, million shares, but that's still well above where it was, you know, a couple decades ago. So, you know, at least it's, I would say vacillating around profitability. Return equity is negative, but you know, it does perk up 2019. It was up to 48%. So, it's just very volatile. I think that's the thing I don't like about the business. It's very up and down. There's no consistency to it. And the technicals are pretty weak. And the backdrop, like I said at the top, was is, is against spending in this area because the cost of capital is going up. So I'm going to pass on this uh, for now until biotech spending reverses. And I don't see that happening anytime soon. All right, let's touch on the IPO market. And we just had Arm Co. Public as well as Instacart. And this new IPO go-round looks a bit different than what we saw in 2021, in the early 2022. Uh, so do you th how do you think this will change the upcoming issues that come out uh, to the public, Luke? Well, I think the overall theme of the IPO market today is that it is fundamentally different than it was even three, four years ago, let alone 10 years ago. When you think about the types of companies that have become public in the past 10 years, you think about the Ubers of the world who didn't make a lot of money. And because like we mentioned in the, to the last caller, or rather to the last question, when the cost of capital is low and when money is free, it doesn't really matter as much. I think what you're going to see going forward is is you don't have that same level of uh, waiting and seeing that you used to have with newly public companies. 
Yeah, and uh, I think the ones that do come public are going to be more profitable yep. and probably bigger. Yep. And having having more staying power. And they're going to line up big investors as opposed to relying on fickle uh, consumers. And that the age of SPACs is over. Yeah, definitely. Definitely over. Thank God. I know. Thank God. All right. Now, I'm Justin Klein with Luke Guerrero, and this completes another Invest Talk program. Steve Peasley and I thank you for listening, and we encourage you to tell your friends and family about our free podcast downloads, which you can find anytime at iTunes, Spotify, or Google Play. And be sure to rate and review. And check out Luke and I's new Invest Talk Classroom series episode on cryptocurrencies. Independent thinking, shared success. This is Invest Talk. Good night. Invest Talk is a trademark of KPP Financial. Because of the nature of the interactive dialogue inherent in the format of this program, it's important for the listener to understand that not all comments made will apply to them. Specifically, nothing said shall be taken to be investment advice, or shall statements on this program be considered an offer to buy or sell security. Because such advice is rendered solely on an individual basis and at times will require that the investor review a prospectus before investing. Invest Talk is a copyrighted program of Klein, Pavlis, and Peasley Financial, a registered investment advisor firm which retains all rights. For more information regarding KPP's investment advisors, call 1-800-557-5461.